Welcome to our Sound for Video session. Today is the 7th of June, 2017. And today we're going to look at mixing headphones. In particular, what I'm talking about here is mixing in post for film. So um, that's kind of be our kind of the perspective from which we're coming for those of you that kind of found yourself here, <laughs> maybe more in the music realm. Um, everything we talk about here, I think will still be relevant, but just understand that our bias is really towards mixing film, which includes both dialogue, music, and effects. So um, our, our purposes may be just a little bit different than pure music mixing. First of all, mixing with headphones is a fairly controversial thing. And the question is, is why is that? Well, it's very difficult to engineer headphones that can accurately reproduce the whole spectrum of sound in a balanced sort of accurate way. And this really isn't surprising because it's totally unnatural to put cups over your ears and have diaphragms with a few centimeters or less vibrating in an attempt to create full spectrum sound. So that, that's really kind of the first thing to keep in mind. But before you start feeling hopeless and like, oh my gosh, I can't afford, you know, near field monitors or speakers. I really have to use headphones or I've got other people in the house or the apartment or whatever it may be. I'm not being totally inflexible here. I understand there are some cases where you want to do that. I just want you to understand that there are some downsides to doing that. Mixing on headphones comes with some challenges, but where the, the kind of the approach I take with headphones is I think they're really useful mixing tools, but I think they're a tool. And for me, I, I will probably do 90% of my mixing on near field monitors or in the vernacular speakers, uh, but I also do 10% on open back over ear headphones to kind of get a different perspective to understand what it will sound like uh, with headphones and also to pick up some things that I can't necessarily um, sort of our figure out with with re regular near field monitors. So they have their place. Um, just be careful. And if you do choose, if, if really headphones is your only option for mixing, I would encourage you for the long term to also plan on budgeting for proper near field monitors that are made for reference um, and add those to your kit. I know, again, it's a challenge. Understand that. Don't want to be impractical, but Anyway, let's 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 dive in and uh, <laughs> talk a little bit more about these. If you want to just jump ahead to the specific headphones that we're going to talk about today, I put links down in the description. So if you're not watching this on YouTube, if you click on the YouTube button and come over to YouTube down in the description, you'll be able to find those. All right, let's go ahead and jump in. So again, I use headphones as a reference point, and I think that's really kind of an interesting and important thing to keep in mind when it comes to mixing sound, whether that be music or for film. Um, you really need to learn your playback system, whether that be headphones, near-field monitors, whatever it may be. And the reason you need to do that is you need to listen on different playback systems so that you can start to learn and understand how your particular headphones and or near-field monitors respond to sound. What their weak points are, what they tend to overemphasize, what they tend to underemphasize, if they tend to have some sort of resonant frequency that rings... All these sorts of things you need to kind of figure out about your playback system, and that applies to headphones as well as to near-field monitors. So um, that's just an important thing to keep in mind. Also note, the goal with reference headphones is to help you find the issues and problems with your mix so that you can fix them. You need sound that you can trust, which doesn't leave you wondering, gosh, is that a problem with my headphones or is that a problem with the mix? So again, there's no such thing as perfect headphones, <laughs> but if, once you get to know your headphones and they're decent quality headphones, I think for the most part, you'll be able to find those problems and fix them when you're mixing. Now, for mixing, I strongly, strongly recommend over-ear headphones, and I also strongly recommend open back, and you can see on a variety of these, clearly they're open back, and some of you may be thinking, well, what if I'm mixing in a noisy place? Well, you've got a problem then, <laughs> a problem that you need to solve. And that's not the ideal situation. Is be, um, the, the reality is, is I have a set of Sennheiser noise-canceling headphones. They're really nice. They have capacitive touch on the outside, so you can actually control the volume. And um, they can be wireless uh, via Bluetooth, but they can also be wired. Um, they have different presets. They're really, really nice when I'm traveling on an airplane. They make the long-haul flights very, very comfortable because <laughs> I'm not listening to engine noise the whole time or the jet noise. Um, but they don't reproduce sound as accurately as an open back headphone can. So I really highly encourage you that when you're, even if you're going to be mixing with headphones, you really probably need to find a place 
that's relatively quiet that you can work in where you can use open back headphones. And yes, noise is going to bleed out of the back of them. So these headphones are not really made for using in public places where you're going to annoy and disturb other people. Um, and these, as far as headphones go, can reproduce sound better than closed back. So mixing well, it, while you're recording is a completely different thing. In that case, you do want closed back so that you don't have uh, sound bleeding out of the headphones and into the microphones. But uh, when you're mixing in post, open back is, is definitely my preference. I would also avoid the noise canceling headphones for another reason. I think that the noise canceling in my experience results in some compromises in the ability of the headphones to reproduce sound as accurately as they need to. I could be wrong on that. That's a, my own personal impression. Um, again, I really love my noise canceling headphones from Sennheiser, but I wouldn't use them for really serious mixing. Another factor that's really important is comfort. If you're gonna be wearing these for an extended period of time, having something that's really comfortable matters. And, you know, little pleather pads versus something that's more like a velour pad um, versus something crazy uh, like these pads here um, can make a huge difference. And so that's another factor that we're going to look at a little bit as well. Another factor, of course, is the amplifier you use to power your headphones. So if you're using a laptop headphone output, um, that's not going to be the same as using a high quality dedicated headphone amplifier or an audio interface or something that has a little bit more um, both amplification power and also higher quality. So you have to be careful there. That's a completely different topic. We're not going to address that in detail here, aside to say that there are differences. All right, so let's dive into the five. Actually, set, I'm going to talk about seven different sets of headphones that I have experience with, five of which I have right here right now. Let's start with the AKGs. Okay, first off, we have the AKG K240 Studio Pro semi-open headphones. So these are semi-open back. Um, by semi-open back, I believe it means it's open, but not as open as fully open back, I guess. <laughs> but this is sort of a compromise between closed back and open back. And uh, these are sort of the budget headphones that we're going to be looking at today. These run uh, $79 US. Yeah, so let's start there. A um, couple of things. First of all, the cable is detachable and it uses this mini XLR connector. So that's nice because if the cable goes bad or you run into some connection issues, that is user replaceable, which is a nice feature. One thing you can tell too, as, you, as we start to look at the higher end headphones, you'll notice that the higher end headphones have the cable that runs to both cups, to both ear cups, not just the one. So this is usually a mark of a, a lower cost headphone. And I think the reasoning for that is then the cable length is the exact same distance uh, from one ear cup to the other ear cup. And so you shouldn't get any phase issues. I don't know. And there may be some other reasoning behind it as well. In this case, it has to run it all to one ear cup and then somehow route it across to the other ear as well. So the one to the other ear is going to be a little bit longer of a cable run. Again, I don't know how much of a, an issue that is, but um, that is something you definitely see on the higher end headphones. The ear cushions on this are not as, as comfortable. They're kind of a pleather, like a plastic leather so a fake leather, it feels like. Maybe they're real leather, I don't know. But they're definitely a leather, so they don't breathe as well. Um, and I do find that over long periods, especially in your, if you're in a, a hot environment, you're probably going to sweat a little bit with these. So that's a little bit of a downside. Almost all the headphones we're going to look at today have a 6.35 millimeter plug, also known as quarter inch, and an eighth inch or 3.5 millimeter plug, both cases TRS, so it's a stereo plug. There's just one exception we'll talk about later, um, but that's nice. You can use it, uh, in this case, you could use it even with your smartphone, um, and you could use it on a more professional grade, um, out of a more professional grade headphone amp. In terms of impedance, these are rated at 55 ohms. Um, we're not going to get into a lot of detail about what impedance is, but generally the idea is that with lower impedance headphones like this, 55 um, you can usually drive those with smartphones and, and things with less capable headphone amplifiers. Um, if you get into the higher um, impedance, like say 200 or 250 or even 300 or 600, generally you're going to need a more powerful headphone amplifier. So that's one important thing to keep in mind. So these are very versatile. Now there is some debate over, you know, whether lower impedance versus higher impedance headphones have higher quality, sound reproduction quality. I think it really depends on the design of the headphone. So I don't think there's one hard and fast rule on that. A lot of people assume that the higher impedance headphones are higher quality because a lot of the higher end headphones have higher impedance rating. That's not true across the board. So 
I wouldn't worry as much about that. Just understand that with the higher impedance, you're not going to be able to drive those um, with your smartphone if for whatever reason that's how you intend to use them. All right, couple of specs. This is rated at um, being able to reproduce 15 hertz through 25 kilohertz. Those ratings are also, I don't know how useful those are, but that is what is listed. Also that its output is at 91 decibels per milliwatt. So um, it produces a strong signal. So you'll be able to hear plenty well. When I actually took this into Adobe Audition and connected this to my Antelope Audio Orion Studio, which is a pretty high-end audio interface, about $2,500 uh, retail price. And um, what I was able to see or hear um, I was able to hear down to 20 hertz and up as high as 15 kilohertz. Now, um, you know, as I'm getting a little older, I can't hear the higher frequencies as well. So generally, I can't hear a whole lot above beyond, uh, beyond 16 kilohertz. Um, but I definitely can hear up to 16 kilohertz. I've tested <laughs> that extensively. Um, on these headphones, the top I was able to hear is 15 kilohertz. Um, when you get down to 20 hertz, some people say you can really feel that more than you can really hear it. Um, what I probably heard was the mechanical noise of the transducers um, sort of flopping around trying to create 20 hertz, but I heard something. <laughs> Again, I'm not, so, I'm not sure how useful that specification is. I think what's really probably more important is the separation you get between tones when, it, when you're actually playing something, some real world sound back. Um, but in any case, that is what it is. So my overall summary on the AKG K240s is that it's a decent sounding set of headphones. Um, for a budget set of headphones. So again, $80 I would is definitely, for mixing reference headphones, is definitely in the budget range. Um, they're not quite as present as some of the higher end, and they sound a little bit muffled relative to the higher end headphones that we're going to talk about today. Um, the bass can sound a little bit on the boomy side and a little bit overstated, um, so it's not perfectly balanced. But again, if you're on a tight budget, this is really a decent option. Um, clearly not in the same league as some of the more expensive headphones we're going to look at today, and some of them are ridiculously expensive and really kind of out of the range of 99.9% .9 of us. Um, so in any case, I think for the price for you know less than $100, technically even less than $80 US, um, this is a pretty good place to start. And so if you're really on a tight budget and you need something that you could rely on, you could definitely learn these headphones and they could serve you well in terms of mixing. Next up, we have the Bear Dynamic DT880 Pros. Um, this is actually a set of headphones that I have owned for about 18 months, and they're my primary um, set of mixing headphones. These run about uh, right around $200 US. There are actually three versions of them with different impedances. There's a 32 ohm version, which would be better suited for working with uh, less capable, I guess, <laughs> headphone amps. Uh, and you could even use it on your smartphone and things of that nature. There's a 250 ohm version, which is the one I have. And there's also a 600 ohm version. So you kind of need to match that to the preamplifier or the headphone amplifier that you're using. The cable on this one is not user replaceable, which is a little bit of a bummer. Um, again, I've owned these for just a little over 18 months and I did have the cable go bad on me. Fortunately, it was still under warranty and I was able to send it back and they they turned it around really surprisingly quickly. I, I'm in the Rocky Mountains, so sort of in the Western United States, I had to send them to the East Coast of the United States and they were able to turn them around in just a couple of days. So it was really impressive what they did, but nevertheless, it would be nice to have a user replaceable cable there. The uh, sort of velour um, ear pads are really, really nice and very, very comfortable, even for long periods and the headband likewise, very kind of soft, supple, either it's leather or some synthetic material. Um, but very comfortable for long periods as well. So um, definitely positive on that front. Again, just like all the others, it does include a 3.5 millimeter and a 6.35 millimeter plug. Uh, mine came with a coiled cable. Um, different people have different opinions about that. I like the coiled cable because then it's not dragging on the ground <laughs> and getting caught under my chair wheels and things of that nature. But um, everyone's got a different opinion on that. It is a three meter cable. Some specifications on this, it uh, can reproduce sound from 5 hertz to 35 kilohertz, um, produces 96 decibels sound pressure level, and it weighs in at 295 grams, so it's, uh, you know, just a little over half a pound. Um, and that, I think, is an important factor as well in terms of comfort. Having lighter headphones, in my experience, generally makes them more comfortable. So... That's a nice thing as well. When I generated tones using Adobe Audition, I could hear between 30 hertz and 16 kilohertz on these. So they actually did a little better on the high end 
versus the AKGs, um, but they didn't go down quite as low on the low end. Nevertheless, 30 hertz is just fine. Like I, did, <laughs> I don't feel like I'm missing anything as a result of that, especially for um, dialogue. You're not going to be getting a whole lot of energy down there, and you're usually going to be using a high-pass filter to get rid of that stuff anyway. So overall, that works just fine. This is a kind of a, you know, a little over double the price of the AKGs, but what I think you get with that is a cleaner overall sound with a lot more separation between frequencies, which again is one of the more important aspects to the quality of mixing headphones for me. They also have very good high frequency response. The bass seemed um, relatively well controlled and it, it uh, seemed like there was nice separation, so it didn't sound really muddy like some bass can. So my overall sense with the DT880 Pros, I'm really happy that I have these. I think they're a great kind of balance between cost and value and quality. Um, and they've worked really, really well for me. Absolutely no um, regrets purchasing these headphones. And, and again, these are my main set of headphones that I use for mixing. And again, I do most of my mixing on near field monitors, but I do about 10% of my mixing uh, using these headphones as well. Next up, we have the Audio-Technica ATH R70X Pro Reference headphones. These are priced at $350 US. Um, this is the first uh, case of the headphones we're looking at today that have cables that connect to both ear cups, so you know that you know generally that's going to be a higher end head headphone. Um, these have these kind of proprietary. Oh no, these have the uh, twisting connectors, so they're kind of a really small um, TRS type of connector. You insert them and then twist them, and they sort of lock in place. So that's a nice feature. One thing that was a little odd is it was a little bit difficult to see which was the left and right. There's just a little letter uh, engraved here and here. Um, on most of the headphones, they're pretty clear about that with clearly marking it out here or on here. <laughs> These were a little more subtle, not a big deal once you learn where they're at, but it took me a while to figure out where it was indicated left and right. Um, these ear pads are incredibly, incredibly comfortable. They're sort of a velour material. And um, then this, this mechanism up here is really comfortable as well. Some people thought, I've heard some people say these seem like they're cheaply made. This is a sort of a very pliable plastic here. Um, but these sort of just, um, they're almost like very um, fluid sort of shock mounting um, that sort of allow your head to rest against these. I found this system to be incredibly comfortable. Like I, I would say this is probably the most comfortable set of headphones we're looking at today. Um, so this is a really good system from my point of view. Some people have complained about this because it's very different. What I like about it is that you don't have something that's putting pressure on the top of your head. It's kind of a, at the edges of the top of your head as opposed to a band that wraps around the entire top of your head. And uh, I found that inc incredibly comfortable. So I really, really liked it. Um, other people have other opinions, just so you're aware. Again, 3.5 millimeter and uh, 6.35 millimeter plugs. So that's one eighth and quarter inch plugs. 3 meter cable, straight cable. This one's rated uh, in terms of impedance at 470 ohms. So this is an example of a headphone that you're probably not going to drive very effectively with a smartphone. You might be able to get away with it, but it's it's uh, you're gonna be cranking the volume probably to max just to get a decent level out of it. Couple of specifications. They say that rep it uh, reproduces sound from five hertz to 40 kilohertz. Now remember, just for practical purposes, it's generally assumed that most, well, not the most humans, that humans <laughs> can generally hear up to about 20 kilohertz. And to be honest, the only people that can really hear up to 20 kilohertz are children. Uh, as you get a little older, your ability to hear high frequency sound diminishes. Um, at the ripe age of 46 years old, um, I can only hear up to a, a, right around 16 kilohertz, maybe a little bit above 16 kilohertz. Um, so when they have specs that say it plays up to 40 kilohertz, I'm, I'm not really sure I understand what the purpose of that would be. And some people may know more about that. I'm, I'm just claiming ignorance here. <laughs> but for me, like having a spec that says it can play up to 40 kilohertz isn't really important to me. It doesn't seem to make a huge difference. Again, generating tones, I was able to hear a pretty nice range on this. I could hear um, somewhere between 30 hertz and 16 kilohertz. So very good reproduction on these as well. Now, the one thing that, in summary, about the Audio Technica is it really stood out to me. I really wanted to like these headphones. <laughs> but the reality is I found them to be really bass heavy. And that's cool if you're going to listen to your music and you like a lot of bass. But I didn't. it didn't seem like it'd be really good for mixing because it just, there's always just, it felt to me, there was still de decent separation. Like I could still hear the high frequencies pretty nicely. 
Um, but it just seemed like there was just way too much bass, so they weren't very balanced. Um, overall, they sounded, again, they sounded nice, especially if I was just listening to music, but I think for mixing, they probably would not be my first choice. All right, next up we have the Shure SRH1840 Pro open back headphones. These are priced at $450 US. Um, the cables, again, to both ear cups, these just sort of snap in. They're, they're a different type of connector that I um, have not seen before, um, but they, they hold nicely. It's not like they're gonna pop out on you. And uh, again, so that's user replaceable, which is really nice. Again, I found the ear pads to be very, very comfortable, the headband comfortable as well. So these work really well on a long-term basis, just like my Bayer Dynamics, I also found these to be very, very comfortable as well. Again, just like all the other, or well, most of the others, 3.5 millimeter and 6.35 millimeter, so one eighth and quarter inch plugs available on this, included with this. Cable on this one's just a little bit shorter at 2.1 meters, which is about uh, almost seven feet. And these are rated at, in terms of impedance, 65 ohms. So these are some that you could probably, again, use with your um, smartphone if you wanted to, or other lesser headphone amplifiers, computer laptops. In terms of specifications, they say that they can reproduce from 10 hertz to 30 kilohertz, uh, 96 decibels of sensitivity. That That is not really, to me, a really super meaningful <laughs> specification. These are also quite lightweight at 268 grams or 9.4 ounces. So again, about just a little over half a pound. Again, which is part of what contributes to the overall comfort of these headphones. I, again, every person's head is different. Every person's ears are different, but I found these personally to be um, quite comfortable. Um, probably in the same league as my DT-880s from Bayer Dynamic. When I generated tones using Adobe Audition, I could hear between 10 hertz um, all the way up to 15 kilohertz. So I lost, it felt like I lost a little bit on the high end. Again, and that, I don't think that's gonna make a huge difference, um, but this one extended way down to 10 hertz, which was kind of interesting and uh, a little bit unique, I guess. So overall, I would say that the Shures had a very nice balanced sound to my ears, not appreciably different than the Bear Dynamic DT880 Pros, but perhaps a little bit more open sounding and perhaps that's because it's a full open back design. So that was nice. So the stereo imaging was good. It felt very open and airy, which was nice. So the question is, would I upgrade from my Bear Dynamics to these? Um, that's, that's a fair bit of upgrade <laughs> in terms of price. And again, I'd say I'd, I think these are a really good option if you've got the cash for them. Um, but I don't know if I would reap a huge benefit over my Bear Dynamics by moving to these. All right, next up, we're going to talk about a set of headphones that I do not happen to have with me, but that I have tried uh, last month in um, May. I had an opportunity to go to the headquarters for Sennheiser, which is based in Hanover, Germany. I got a chance to listen to a couple of sets of headphones. Let me talk first about their HD 800s. Now, now we're talking about a completely different league of headphones. And um, I'll put a, a picture of these up on the screen here. Again, I don't have them here with me here, but I got to use them there. These are priced at $1,400 US dollars. Um, there's also a newer version with some sound absorbing technology to further ensure separation and reduce comb filtering. Um, those are called the HD 800 S's. They run $1,700 US and uh, they're really quite impressive too. But I'm talking here specifically about the HD 800s. Um, in terms of the kind of the overall specs, again, the cable's user replaceable. It runs to both ear cups, three meters long. It uh, This one actually, I believe, just has a 6.35 millimeter or quarter inch TRS plug. So these are clearly not made for working with your smartphone or your laptop. <laughs> They're rated at 300 ohms impedance. So again, needs a good strong amplifier. Probably, again, not made for... For smartphones. In terms of specs, it says it can reproduce sound from 6 hertz to 51 kilohertz. I didn't get to reproduce any tones on this because, again, I was just in their listening room, um, but it sounded very good. The, the total harmonic distortion was rated at 0.02% at 1 kilohertz, which is very good. And again, these weighed in at 260 grams. These were um, probably the most comfortable, different feeling headphones I've ever worn. Um, they almost sort of create an uh, like a little room around each of your ears. So you don't feel like uh, the cups are, you know, holding things in place along with the band over the top of your head. But um, they nothing is actually touching your ear beyond that. And it's really kind of an interesting sensation. Um, in terms of sound, uh, they, this sounded incredibly clear. Great separation between frequencies. 
I was able to hear very subtle nuances at very reasonable volumes, very well-balanced bass through high frequency. Um, these really wowed me. And if I stumble into a fair bit of cash, which is not earmarked for other purposes, which is unlikely, unfortunately, I would not hesitate to buy these headphones. They're incredibly comfortable. The ear cups, again, um, I don't know. I guess I, these, these headphones almost kind of ruined me. <laughs> I was really, really impressed with the Sennheiser HD 800s. All right, we do have one set of very high-end headphones here. These are the Odyssey LCD-X planar magnetic headphones. And uh, these actually use a different technology for the transducers. The transducers are the, the things that actually vibrate and make the sound waves. Um, this is, uses a planar dynamic technology as opposed to a dynamic. Uh, sorry, this uses a planar magnetic technology as opposed to a dynamic. I think dynamic is very similar to regular speakers. Um, just using a magnet coil that moves the diaphragm back and forth. Um, I don't entirely understand what magnetic planar does, <laughs> but um, this does use a different technology. And with that different technology, I can say that it does sound incredible. They really, really do sound. And by incredible, I'm not just saying they made my music sound awesome. What I mean by that is that there was in this incredible clarity and balance. You could hear the different elements of sound. You could hear... Um, all of the different instruments in a music track. You could hear, um, there, and you know, when you had an effects track along with dialogue and music at the same time, you could he clearly hear each of them. It wasn't like they were all bunched together on top of each other. You could just hear each one very, very nicely. Uh, this again has uh, cables to each one. It uses a mini XLR connector that locks, um, so those are user replaceable. In addition to um, the 6.35 millimeter, which is kind of the default cable, there's an adapter to go to 3.5 millimeter, so you can use this with, a, with your laptop or your smartphone. It's rated at 20 ohms in terms of its impedance, which is very kind of unusual for high-end headphones. Um, but of course, it's going to sound better with a more capable headphone amplifier. In addition to that, it comes with a cable that has um, an XLR4 connector, so you can use it with audiophile types of headphone amps. <laughs> I don't have one of those. Um, but it's nice to know that this has that option. As I mentioned before, these have these incredibly thick and uh, very, very comfortable headphone ear pads. Um, you can get them in two different versions. There's a lambskin version and there's a non-animal based version. So if, if that's of a concern to you, you can get a, a vegan version. Um, these are incredibly large <laughs> and it looks like you're a bit of an alien when you wear these, um, but there's, there's some, some good trade-offs for that. Running through the specs, 5 hertz to 20 kilohertz uh, reproduction. And they actually say up to 50 kilohertz extension. I have no idea what that means. Um, and again, I'm not sure how important that really is, but that's one thing they said. Total harmonic distortion was less than 1%. Um, could produce 95 decibel sound pressure levels, I assume, at 1 milliwatt. And these weigh in at 600 grams. These are by far the heaviest headphones of all of those we're talking about today. In terms of generating tones, I could definitely hear down to 20 hertz with these. Um, and again, I don't know how much of that is 20 hertz versus just hearing the transducer move back and forth. Um, <laughs> whatever it is, I could hear something at 20 hertz and again, up to 16 kilohertz. So it was a, um, and overall, I will say they sounded very balanced. In other words, you didn't seem, it didn't seem like the bass was overwhelming or more powerful than the high frequency or the mid tones. So it was a very nice balance. The interesting thing about these headphones is that they just have this really incredible separation between frequencies and sound sources. Again, I felt like I, I just like the Sennheiser HD 800s, I felt like I could hear every element of sound in the recording or the mix. So again, if there was dialogue and there was music and there were sound effects, I could clearly hear each of those. And what was interesting, I played back some of the previous mixes I did, especially for a film I worked on, of like a micro documentary with my friend Levi called The Music Maker. Um, we had, of course, music effects and dialogue. And there was one point at which, uh, where the music is sort of swelling at kind of the climax, and there's some dialogue as well. I noticed just for one word that there was probably some constructive interference between the dialogue and the music where... Um, things kind of jumped out and there may have been even just a little bit of distortion, something that I didn't notice on my uh, monitors or on my headphones, uh, my bare dynamics. So 
this gave me a little bit more, I guess, resolving power, or I don't know if that's the right term, but the ability to hear things that I couldn't necessarily hear with my other monitoring tools. Um, so that was kind of interesting. Now, if I could say anything bad about these, the one thing I didn't like about these is that they are very heavy at 600 grams. Um, that is the equivalent of, what is that in pounds? I think that's close to a pound. No, it's actually a little over a pound. Um, and that doesn't sound like a huge difference, but it is, um, I found these to be a little bit uncomfortable for longer periods. Um, they're fine at first, especially with these massive, you know, ear pads, but uh, they got a little uncomfortable just because they were so heavy and I felt like there was quite a bit of pressure on top of my head as a result of the weight. But again, overall, amazing headphones. Now, just as a bonus, because, and, and I really feel like the last two pet sets were kind of a bonus too, because most of us can't afford those and in our lifetimes, and, and I'm not sure I'll ever be able to. But the next one I'm going to talk about here is even more ridiculous. <laughs> and it was a once in a lifetime experience to use them. This was the Sennheiser HE1, which are also known as the Sennheiser Orpheus, also known as, by Sennheiser's uh, reckoning, the best headphones in the world. And um, they actually might be right about that. I don't know. <laughs> but these are $50,000 US headphones. And um, don't don't freak out about this. this is, I just want to tell you about the experience just because it's interesting. But and Sennheiser probably doesn't make a whole lot of these again. It's like, like Halo cars, like, you know, a lot of the auto manufacturers make halo cars and there's they don't sell a lot of them but it's just kind of what can we what can we accomplish if we really put our minds to it and that's kind of the same thing and again i got to hear these in a special listening room in hanover last month when i went to the sennheiser headquarters they were very kind and let me i i actually requested i wanted to hear them because i'd heard about them um and it was really an interesting experience so that price sounds ridiculous, but there really are, a, there's a lot of engineering that went into these, a lot of technology. There's, there are also some luxury elements to it as well. So it also includes a premium tube amplifier with eight specially designed vacuum tubes housed in a spring-loaded damped marble case with retracting tubes and controls. The whole experience of seeing it turned on is, is pretty jaw-dropping <laughs> and very nerdy. Um, it then has a glass top door which gently opens to reveal the compartment where the headphones are stored. It has multiple digital to analog converters which are somehow summed or compared to eliminate all of the noise that could potentially be introduced into the signal chain. And another unique thing about it is that it has high voltage amplifiers that are integrated into the ear cups so that you're not amplifying down at a separate unit and then sending the amplified signal through the cable. Instead, you're sending the, the signal through the cable and then amplifying it at the ear cups. And then of course it's using gold vaporized ceramic transducers. <laughs> so rather than really kind of list all the specifications, I will say that they sounded absolutely positively amazing. The clarity, the balance, the stereo imaging, the separation of tones were all really superb. The headphones are incredibly comfortable. And again, essentially created this room around each of your ears. They didn't make me cry, but I did end up with a goofy grin on my face after the experience. And I'm really grateful that Sennheiser let me listen to them just for the experience. So just sort of to wrap up and to, and to kind of summarize here, headphones are, uh, I think, a very valuable mixing tool. Again, I wouldn't recommend using them as your only mixing playback system, um, unless that's your only, absolutely only option. I definitely, if you do, go with open back. Um, or semi-open back. And I would make a plan for your long term to invest in both a space and um, powered monitors that you can use, near field monitors or speakers. Um, so you can actually get that sound as well. It's, I think it's important to do that. You do also need to listen on lots of different playback systems that can make a huge difference in helping you understand this kind of the strengths and the weaknesses of your, your headphones and your near field monitors. So um, there are lots of good options at different price points we've covered here. Um, I'm really happy with my choice of the DTA80 Pros. If I could, I'd really love to upgrade to the Sennheiser HD 800s or even the Shure that we looked at. These are really nice as well. Um, if I had the money, I, I probably would have bought these. Um, but again, these, these are serving me pretty well, so I don't know if the cost difference here justifies really investing in these unless I were to go up to something more like the Sennheiser HD 800. Uh, but there are lots of good options out there. Even the AKGs, while, you know, you kind of get spoiled listening to headphones like this, 
Um, you could still learn to mix um, and get, get your ears accustomed to kind of the weaknesses of a headphone like this and still make a really good mix. So um, these are much better than you're going to get with most closed back headphone models in terms of the, the overall sound reproduction you can do when you're mixing. Um, it doesn't have all the, the, the nice features. Again, the, uh, the, head, the, the ear pads are kind of a pleather. But again, if you're on a tight budget, it's a pretty good option. So hope that was helpful. Go ahead and leave any questions you have down below. And if you have not already subscribed, make sure you do that. For those of you in my course, um, I hope you're having a good time learning new things and getting out there and making some great recordings. And we'll talk to you again next week. Take care, everyone.